on, but I would like to introduce Pastor Gary Rice and his wife, Tammy, if you guys would like to come up this morning. And I'll turn the service over to you. Well, good morning, Bakersfield. This is my, uh, this is my daughter here with me today. This is my bride of 35 years. We just celebrated 35 years, right? Pretty good. So uh, we have two daughters and three grandchildren, and uh, we're just really excited to be here. So Tammy, why don't you say hi to the fine folks at Bakersfield? I just love saying Bakersfield. It's just, that's just so West Coast, Bakersfield. There you go. Hon. Well, good morning. We're from Orlando, Florida. And believe it or not, we were cold here yesterday. <laughs> I was coming out of the hotel, and I was like, I need a jacket. I was so cold. So we have a lot of humidity in Orlando. Of course, you walk out, and you just start sweating. But I can tell you, I have felt the presence of God in this place. Um, last night, my husband was downstairs in the hotel, and he was um, doing some last-minute prep. And I was in my hotel room, and I began to put worship, praise and worship music on. And I tell you, the power of God was so strong in the hotel room last night. And I said, God, I'm believing for lives to be changed today, for pieces of people's lives to be put back together again, for healing to take place in this room, for restoration. Whatever it is that you need this morning, I just pray that as my husband delivers his sermon this morning, as God uses him as a vessel, that you will just receive all that God has for you this morning, because I truly believe that miracles are birthed out of expectancy this morning. And as you come and as you hear this morning, believe with your heart, and I believe we're going to see miracles take place this morning. Amen? Amen. Thank you, honey. Tammy and I were here about two and a half years ago, and um, I've known Pastor Eddie for about four years ago when uh, General Council was in Orlando. Uh, he, uh, he visited our church that Sunday morning, and we just hit it off really, really well. I don't know if I told you this last time, but he and I were wearing the same jeans to church that day when he visited with me. And I don't, I don't know if his girl called my girl. I don't know how that all took place, but uh, it was a connection. And then when Fifty Shades of Grace came out, um, our church ordered a case of them, and we did a, a Bible study on Wednesday nights or using the book. And uh, my dad, who um, uh, 85 years old, passed away actually a year ago this week, uh, my dad was visiting with us, and uh, I said, Dad, here's a good book for you to read. And uh, he went in the other room of the church there, and, and he read it. And he liked it so much, he read it twice, and he just thought it was one of the best books on grace ever written. And uh, I just want to let you know you have an awesome church. I've caught a couple of your sermons online. I watched it on Facebook and on the website. And it is just a privilege to be a part of something really, really awesome. Just turn to the person next to you and say you're blessed. Would you tell them that? This morning, I don't have any notes for you, but if you want to write this down, would you just write down this classic scripture, Romans 8.28? I know you know Romans 8.28, but I'm going to give you the abbreviated version of Romans 8.28, and here's what it says. All things work together for my good. That's the abbreviated version. All things work together for my good. Say that with me today, would you? All things work together for my good. Well, I heard that this is a place where wholeness begins. Is that true? Is this a place where wholeness begins? But are there any broken people in the room today? Is there anyone who's ever been broken? Come on, just raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, you know you're lying. Come on, we've all been broken here today. We all go through hard times. We all suffer. For some of us, maybe it's an alcoholic parent or an alcoholic spouse. For some of us, it's grease that never quite healed, wrongs that maybe were never righted, memories that just can't be erased, we have scars on both the outside, and a lot of time we have scars on the inside. Maybe you were raised in dysfunction, and now here you are, a follower of Jesus, and you're trying to raise a nice Christian home and do everything right, but it was never modeled for you, and now you find a lot of insecurities, even when you're trying to do life, and it seems like everyone else seems to be getting it, but maybe you're just not doing it. I understand exactly what you're talking about today. It's been a little while now, about 10 years ago, but Tammy and I had a home burglary. We came home, my daughter and I, I picked her up from school. She was still in high school at the time. And, and as we got next to the house, we could hear the alarm system chirping just a little bit. It was making a weird sound. We realized something was wrong. We backed away. We looked in the window. We saw a broken window on the other side of the house. We called the police. And 
Um, fortunately, they, they didn't do anything stupid. They did steal a few small items, but they didn't ramsack the house or anything like that. And we, we survived and we got past that. But we made sure that our alarm system was monitored from then on with the, the paid service. And they told us to test our alarm system at least once a month. And I just can't do it. I just can't test it once a month. I, I'll test it every now and then. But you're supposed to put the alarm on test, and then you're supposed to walk through the house, and you're supposed to set off the motion detectors or open a window or a door. And every time I do that, the alarms start blaring, and it's a piercing sound. And i got to tell you, it creates some anxiety in me. I mean, here I am, a man of God and a man of faith, but it kind of takes me back to that moment when someone violated our privacy and someone broke into our sacred space. And every time that alarm goes off, it just kind of sends chills up and down my spine. As I told you, Tammy and I celebrated 35 years of marriage, uh, actually about what, two weeks ago now, August 27th. And uh, we went away, and we were at this uh, resort little area just kind of getting away, and, and they had this ceramics class. And I said, man, anything more romantic than you and your girl, like doing ceramics? So, so you know, uh, so we went to this ceramics class, and we picked this little thing out, and we painted it together. And then we left it overnight for them to do some kind of baking or glaze into it or something. And the next day, while, while Tammy was at the pool kind of relaxing, I, I took the little five-minute walk over to where I could pick up our ceramics piece. And I picked up this beautiful piece. And I got to tell you, as I was walking back slowly to the pool, I was so freaked out that I was going to drop this thing and break it. In fact, when we got there to the pool, the first thing I did was I said, put it down, Tammy, give me my phone. Let's take a picture of it so at least we would have a picture if I broke it. Well, I'm happy to report to you that we made it home, and it's now in, a, in our shelf, and we're really excited about that. But there's a scripture in the Bible, Psalms 31:12, specifically that says this. I am forgotten as though I were dead. Listen to this line. I have become like broken pottery. I have become like broken pottery. Hard times. Hard times in our lives are like broken pottery. I mean, after you've become broken, sometimes you feel useless. Sometimes you feel worthless. Or at best, you feel like you're second class. You feel like there's always a mark or there's always a scar in your life. I read a book in high school. I was a soccer guy back in high school, and I read this book called Eric. It was about a soccer player who uh, developed this uh, leukemia illness. And, and uh, Doris Lund wrote a beautiful description that to this day I remember. Let me read it to you. Here's what, she, here's what she wrote, and I remember this from years ago. She was waiting for the doctor to call her. They had done some tests, and they weren't sure whether or not he had it or not, and she was waiting for the phone call. And here's what she writes. The next afternoon, when the phone rang, my heart lurched as if I had been shot. It rang. It rang. There was no way to undo this phone call. She says, once when I was 19 and up at my family's summer house, we watched as a huge thunderstorm came swiftly out of the mountains and marched towards us across the lake. Bolt by bolt, it seemed to be heading directly for our porch. I remember saying nervously, they're getting the range. And with that, the house was struck. And now not many years later, sitting in my bedroom, still holding the telephone, that whole scene in the summer cottage, the same sensation, even the strange electrical smell returned at that moment. A tremendous flash split my world. The bolt entered the top of my skull as I got the message, Eric has leukemia. It was something happening right this minute. We had been struck. I have a little illustration I'll show you. Honey, I'll need that plastic bag if I could just because um, I don't want these pieces to go all over the place today. But I picked up this piece of ceramics. Have you ever felt like, have you ever felt like a part of your life was just broken suddenly? You know, just kind of like when I go through the house and I'm testing the alarm system and I can hear it. The, the alarms go, I know it's a test, but still something sensational inside of me, the sound just, just kind of impacts me. And I want you to think about that when I take this hammer and I break this piece of pottery. You're going to hear it, and it, it's going to be that sudden bolt of lightning that Doris Lund talks about in the book, Eric. 
It's when you get that phone call. It's when you get that letter. It's when you get that text message. It's, it's when you get that news of something that happens in your life. It's pretty powerful, isn't it, that sound? That we hear that in our lives, and then we're left with all the broken pieces. I have a question for you today. What's broken inside of you? I mean, we've already told each other that there's something that was broken inside of us. And this is a place where wholeness begins. And today we're going to talk about the broken pieces and what we feel like when that brokenness hits our lives. Maybe another question is, what was your hammer? Was it the letter from the lawyer? Was it the doctor office visit? Was it the text from your ex? Maybe it was the abusive, abusive parent or the abusive spouse. I mean, we often ask the question, don't we? Why can't things just go back to the way they were? Can, can we get an undo? Can we get a mollican here? Can we just kind of have an undo to this? Can we just wake up tomorrow and it be last week instead of after when we heard the news? We try to pretend it never happened, right? So we have these scars and we have this brokenness in our lives, but maybe, maybe we, we can fake our way through it and pretend like it never happened. I've come here today with a message for you. God loves broken people. God loves broken people. You know, we love it when God returns things back to its original condition. I mean, if God could pull out his super glue and just kind of do his miracle thing and restore the years the locusts have eaten, that's often. But I've noticed often what God does is he uses our brokenness to create a new kind of beauty. A beauty that requires, no, a beauty that demands that there first be brokenness in your life. Now listen, we're never past the point of God's touch, never past the point of God's renewing or his regenerating or his repurposing in our lives. But out of our brokenness comes something new, some, some new life, some new possibilities today. You see, brokenness has a power, unlike other things, to bring forth new beauty, new strength, new inspiration to others. Because it's often in these moments, when we've tasted suffering, that we notice that we were made for something more. There's a lot more. There's purpose. Uh, again, I, I don't have notes for you today, but let me just very quickly just remind you of what God's Word says about how God does new things in our lives. Like Revelation 21.5 where he says, Behold, I am making all things new. Or 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Or Isaiah 43.19. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Or Psalms 147.3. It says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Or Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Well, I heard about something uh, uh, about two years ago. Our, our church, uh, our, our, there's a new road going in front of our church, and we're really excited because we had a two-lane road, and the state is coming in, and they're, they're spending, you know, gazillions of dollars to make this a beautiful four-lane road. But, but as a result of it, uh, the sign, our church sign, it's an old sign. It's been weathered. Uh, it was too close. It's, it's on the easement, and they gave us some money for it, but they told us that we had to replace the sign. And, man, I was kind of excited about it. We're going to get a new sign, right? The state's going to pay for a new sign. And, and if we're going to get a new sign, it's time to bring it up to date. We wanted one of these digital signs that we could change and so forth and found out that our zoning wouldn't allow us to have the more modern sign. And I checked with the county, and I said, what do they got to do? And they said, well, the good news is your property already has a future plan use that would allow it, but you have to go through the process of turning the property into that new use purpose. So we went to the county, and we got things rolling, and all of a sudden, as they're going through the checklist, they realized that we had a few permits. Our, our church property is about 50 years old. We, we had a few permits that were never closed out, a roofing. We had a new roof years ago, and the roofer never closed out the permit, and that was a pretty easy one to fix. And then I remember being at the county office when the hammer came down. 
she said, um, you don't have a certificate of occupancy. For 50 years, we've been worshiping in this location, illegally. And I, some of you builders will understand this. When you build a brand new building, everything is up to code and you can build it. But when you take an older building and now you're trying to get a brand new first time issued, you know, certificate of occupancy, it's, it's an issue. It's a hassle. And man, anything that they could find wrong, they were finding wrong. And there's no grandfather. And, and I got to tell you, I just now I'm freaking out. I, I'm not even telling my congregation. I told my board, but I said, don't tell anybody because I, I I don't, want to, I don't want to feel badly when they come in and arrest us all during the church service. I, I play innocent or something, right? For a period of several months, because we had to go through a process, and we had to go through a thing, and the fire department had to come, and the, and the inspectors had to come, and, and they kept finding things and so forth. And, and all it was is because we were getting a new sign. We thought we were getting blessed. I met with one of the people at the county, and she knows I'm the pastor, and she said, you know, pastor, she said, um, I understand what you're going through. She said, in fact, have you ever heard of this Japanese thing called kintsuchi? I said, no, what, what is it? She said, it's this form of artwork where the Japanese take the broken pieces of pottery and they glue them together with gold. It's, they mix the glue with the gold. And instead of trying to hide the marks, instead of trying to make it go back to the way it was, they create a new beauty. So in my hotel the other day, I took a pot just like that one. Honey, hand that to me, would you? And, and I did my best attempt at the Japanese art form of kintsuchi here. It's, you can see, you, you take the cracks and you glue them together and... And in case you're wondering, I didn't use real gold, just in case, you're, in case you're wondering. But I found out that this Kintsuchi artwork is actually a, a very prized possession now and that, and that a lot of people actually collect this. And you can look on eBay and, and maybe what started out as maybe a $100 vase now becomes a $1,500 vase because the beauty that once was destroyed, we thought, has now been replaced with something more beautiful in its place. Now, there's three types of Kintsuchi repair. There's the thin line repair. That's, that's when the two pieces go back together and they fit pretty nicely and it's just the thinnest of line the artist has to use. And I've noticed that in our brokenness, sometimes it's just a thin line crack, right? We lost a job, but a new job fixes that pretty quickly, right? We lost one opportunity, but a new opportunity comes along, and it's kind of a thin line crack and repair. I mean, if you're going to be broken, I vote for the thin line brokenness. But then there's something called the fill-in repair. Probably can't see it too well, but it's where the pieces disappear, and there's a hole left in the pottery. And they don't have a piece to fill in the hole. So the artist takes gold. And he fills in the hole with the goal. And I don't know what hole you have in your soul, but I want you to know that God the artist is filling in the hole with gold. He's filling in that void in your life with gold. And the third type of repair, which is the most damaging, is the replacement piece. It's when a, a piece disappears, it, it's gone, and... And, and the artist can't find a piece to fill in the hole, so he looks among his other pieces of pottery that had been broken, and he finds a piece that will fit the original piece. I mean, I think the best way to understand this is, have you ever driven down the road and you've seen someone who's driving a white minivan, but they have a blue door? Have you seen that? Uh, they were in an accident, right? And, and the door was too bent up to fix, so they went to the junkyard and uh, they got a replacement door and they haven't painted it yet. God might need to repair you with something that you've never even considered before. I mean, you weren't looking for it because it didn't look like what you were used to. 
You didn't look for it because it didn't look like the original. But I got good news for you. God's got something new in your life that's different than what it was before. And it adds beauty to your life. See, here's the deal. I know you're broken. But you are now better than new. You're better than new. Let that soak in for a moment. You're better than new. I mean, it takes a lot of work to fix that which is broken. And I think God has done a pretty good job. If you're sitting next to someone that God did a pretty good job on, just tell them right now. Come on, God did a pretty good job of fixing you. Don't be ashamed of your scars. Listen, you're worth it. You're so much worth it. Yeah, you were broken, but let me tell you what you have now. Now you have a story. Now you have history. Don't be ashamed of the deep crevices in your life. Don't be ashamed of the broken pieces in your life. There's an amazing story to tell. I get it. You're hearing me, but some of you are still thinking that you're beyond repair. That's just a lie of the devil. No one in this room is beyond repair. And no one in this room is beyond restoration. God can do a work in every one of your life. So my question for you today is, are you ready for a Romans 8.28 life? Are you ready for a Romans 8.28 life? All things work together for my good. Are you ready for a Romans 8.28 life? When a relationship falls apart, Romans 8.28. When you experience abuse, Romans 8.28. When you're blindsided, Romans 8.28. Come on, folks. This is a place where wholeness begins, right? With God's help, I'm broken no more. Say it with me. I'm broken no more. One more time, I'm broken no more. See, you'll know that the healing is taking place when you stop seeing your brokenness as a loss and you start seeing your brokenness as a gain. The new you won't look like the old you, but the new you is going to be so much beautiful and so much more valuable. You're not the only one who has experienced brokenness. I mean, the devil likes to make you think that you're the only one who has experienced brokenness, but you're not the only one. The hammer fell on Tammy and me. Our oldest daughter, when she was nine years old, perfectly healthy, suddenly diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumor. Tammy and I were talking about this the other day as I was prepping. I was like, honey, just... Remind me again, where, where were we when we heard the news? And she could describe in vivid color the room we were sitting in when the team of doctors came in. The hammer fell. The hammer fell again four years later, one week before Thanksgiving, on that Thursday morning, one week before Thanksgiving. The night before, my daughter, Joya, was not feeling well, and I remember I stayed up with her and waited till she fell asleep. And then my wife went in to wake her up, and she never woke. The hammer fell on our family. We have some deep scars. We have some voids. We have some holes in our lives. And if I went around the room today, and time doesn't let us, but if I went around the room today, we could each take our turns today talking about the time when the hammer fell and the brokenness and the holes. Remember that sound? That's what we hear, and that's what we feel when the hammer falls. But I'd like to take you to another room. I'd like to take you to a room where it's now Sunday night, Easter Sunday night, and the disciples are in the room. Jesus had just died and buried, and the disciples weren't sure if he had risen from the dead yet. And here it is, Easter Sunday night, and Jesus walks into the room, and he says, take a look at my scars. A week later, when doubting Thomas, who hadn't been there the week before, was in the room, Jesus shows up, and he says, Thomas, Touch my scars. Touch my scars. It's me. It's really me. I went through something. I'm claiming victory in my life. Jesus had scars, not because of his inability to heal them. He could have. But because they were a trophy to his victory. It wasn't a deformity. It was a sign of dignity of his sacrifice. It was a badge of identity proof of the finished work that he had done. When they pierced the nails through his feet, 
I now can look at the scars and the feet of Jesus. And I can be reminded of his victory every single time I want to run away. I can look at the scars in his hands, and every time I want to throw my hands up and just quit, I can remember the scars in his hands. I can remember the scar at his side where the soldier took the spear and, and jabbed it in his side. And every time something ugly on the inside of me wants to come out, I can remember that Jesus gave me victory because of the scar on his side. I can think about the scar on his back where he took the whipping. And every single time I'm not ready to face the truth and I want to turn my back, I can think about the scars of Jesus and the victory he brings for me. Or the scars on his head when they pounded the crown of thorns in his head and all those thoughts come into my mind. I can now take them into captivity because all I got to do is look at the scars of Jesus on his head and know that he's won the victory for me today. I want to invite the keyboardists to come up today. As I begin to land the plane here today, I want to tell you this. It's time to turn your wounds into scars. You see, a wound will keep you down and out. A, a wound will keep you paralyzed. But a scar says, I've been healed. A scar says, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Your scars do not disqualify you. See, here's what the devil likes to do. Before you enter the race, he likes to tell you that you are unqualified to enter the race. He likes to tell you that you're too broken to enter the race. But I'm talking to a bunch of folks today that at some time in your life, you push through that lie and you've entered the race. Can I say amen to that? But that devil... If he can't get you to think that you're unqualified, after you start at running the race, he'll start to make you think you're disqualified, that you ought to quit, that you ought to run, and you ought to just drop out. How many times can you fail? How many times can the pieces be repaired? Listen, the devil is a liar, and you are neither unqualified nor are you disqualified to run the race. So let your scars be your freedom. Freedom to remember. Freedom to remember that God still loves you and has healed you today, and you're walking tall and you're walking stronger because of the healing power of God. So the old question that we used to ask is, why did this happen? And today I want to replace it with a new question. Okay, God, now what? Where do we go from here? I'm going to let my scars be a testimony that wholeness begins in my life because of the healing power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now you're ahead and close your eyes. And I did this in the first service with, with my message, but it pertains to this message as well. So with your eyes closed and your head bowed, I want you to think about the wounds. I want you to visually think about those wounds. I want you to see them. I want you to remember what caused those wounds. Or like he said, the hammer that brought them, what took place, what it did to you. I want you to think about that. I want you to get that into your mind. It might be painful. And so those of you watching at home, I want you to do the same thing. Wherever you're at, just stop. And I want you to think about the wounds that have come into your life. Those feelings, let those feelings come back up. Because like he said, that today those wounds are gonna become scars. And those scars give glory to Jesus. So as you get those things in your mind and you're ready to release them, I just want you to lift your hand. Like you're giving it away, like you're passing it on, you're pushing it away, you don't want it anymore. It's over, it's done, it's gone, you're healed, you've got scars. And like you said, now what? If I didn't have the microphone, I'd have both my hand raised. You guys know the scars that I've got. We, we, give, we give it to you today, God. Lord, as a congregation, as a group, as a family, as a team, as one member of your body, Lord, we surrender to you our wounds. We get rid of those hurt feelings, those things that have been holding us back, those things that have been binding us down, and today we loosen ourselves from the grip of those wounds, and we bind ourselves together with your will and with your spirit. 
Those things that have had us crouched down and pushed down today, Lord, we stand up with our backs straight and our chins high with forgiveness and healing. And Lord, those wounds will never bring us back down again, but they'll be a stepping stone for us to move on to greater things, for us to share our testimonies with others. Because like he said, like Pastor Gary said, now we have a story. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if there's one that doesn't have Jesus, the Holy Spirit, living in your heart, would you raise your hand this morning? If there's one, raise your hand, make eye contact with me. Thank you. Bless you. Hallelujah. Is there any more? Anyone else? We're going to pray with this new believer. And those of you on Facebook and on the videos that are watching us, if you just repeat after, after me this morning, together, family, let's repeat. Dear Jesus, I come before you now. And I confess that I'm a sinner. Lord, I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And I ask you to forgive my sins. Holy Spirit, come and live in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe that if you said that prayer, that's just a prayer, but it will bring you back to the point where you believed in Jesus. So whether you're watching online or you're here with us today, you're now saved and you're in the house and the family of God. Amen. Let's give the Lord ovation of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gary, that was a great message. That was great. We're going to pray over your tithe and offering, and the church is going to write the, the pastors a, a check. But uh, what I want to share with you this morning is this. The Bible says that if you give, it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. I want to be overflowing this morning. Amen. And as pastor always says, even if all you have is a button off your shirt, put in the offering. You can give online. You can text it. You can put it in a box. We don't take the offering here. But uh, however you want, can give today, give. And let's pray over that offering this morning. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for the gift and the giver this morning. Lord, but I pray that you would take whatever gifts are given today, whatever is tied today, whatever is put in the box today, whatever is given online today, and Lord, I pray that you would anoint it to do your work. I pray that you would touch it, multiply it, cause it to grow, and that you would use it however you see fit. And that, Lord, for the giver, I pray a special blessing and anointing. God, I pray that it would be given back to them, pressed down. I pray that it would be overflowing. I pray for financial freedom, financial breakthrough. That, God, there would be a a healing in their lives. And, Father, there would be just a complete blessing back to them. Father, you've given to us. We want to give back. We love you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Jim, come and close us out. I have about five large pieces up here after the service after we're leaving today if you just need a reminder that you were broken but God healed you I just invite you to just take those pieces take a piece home with you set on your dresser and just every time the devil wants to tell you that you're worthless you just remind him that you have a great artist who's put you back together thank you Jim Glory to God. Did we enjoy today's service, the message? Amen. It's a privilege to have this man of God and his wife here. They're such a blessing. If we all ever get to go to Florida, we need to go visit their church. Amen. Um, I'm not the preacher, but I'm going to add this. Pastor Eddie, forgive me. I'm going to add it anyway. (laughs) I just want to say that when we are broken, and when God puts us back together, we are stronger than we before we were broken. We're much stronger because we have been broken many times in our lives. My wife and I have been married 45 years. We've had a lot of trials and tribulations. A lot of things came up that just shook us. But we're stronger today than we were before it all happened. That's what I want to say. Just stand up. Father, we just thank you for your blessings. Father God, we thank you for the message and the gift that you sent to us today, Lord. We just give you honor and glory, Father God, that we can be a blessing to someone else and to share our testimony to somebody that can help someone maybe get to their, get fixed quicker than what maybe we did, Lord God. Just give you, thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name.